Hello and good morning everyone. This is Dr. Muhammad Ali and today we have to deal with a very important interesting topic from CNS Pharmacology that is about anti-epileptic medications, anti-epileptic drugs or AEDs. So let's get right into it. Anti-epileptic drugs by definition are, are the drugs which are used to prevent or control epilepsy. These drugs usually do not cure epilepsy. Epilepsy is a chronic medical condition produced by sudden changes in the electrical function of the brain. It is a condition characterized by recurrent episodes of seizure. Seizure is basically a paroxysmal, meaning sudden, abnormal, high-frequency discharge of cerebral neurons. We need to differentiate it from convulsions or fits, which are involuntary violent spasmodic contractions of skeletal muscles. Approximately 10% of the population has at least one seizure in their lifetime. Globally, epilepsy is the fourth most common neurologic disorder after brain, migraine, cerebral vascular disease, stroke and Alzheimer's disease. Now, as you can see on the slide, we have a list of causes which can cause epilepsy. And on the top of the list, we have congenital or congenital defects, head injuries, traumas, hypoxia. Certain infections can do it. For example, meningitis, brain abscess, viral encephalitis. Concussions, depressed skull and fractures can do it. Certain brain tumors can do it. Drug withdrawals can do it. Fever in children, febrile concussion, con con convulsions, and hypoglycemia, and hypocalcemia, and certain metabolic disorders can do it as well. Approximately 10% of the population has at least one seizure in their lifetime. Globally, epilepsy is the fourth most common neurologic disorder after brain, migraine, cerebral vascular disease, stroke, and Alzheimer's disease. Now, as you can see on the slide, we have a list of causes which can cause epilepsy. And on the top of the list, we have congenital or congenital defects, head injuries, traumas, hypoxia. Certain infections can do it. For example, meningitis, brain abscess, viral encephalitis. Concussions, depressed skull and fractures can do it. Certain brain tumors can do it. Drug withdrawals can do it. Fever in children, febrile concussion, con con convulsions, and hypoglycemia, and hypocalcemia, and certain metabolic disorders can do it as well. Now let's switch gears and talk about the types of seizures. We basically have two types of seizures, broadly speaking, focal seizures and generalized seizures. If the seizure is confined to any specific side of the brain, and if it doesn't involve both sides of the cerebral hemispheres, then we call it a focal seizure. In this type of seizure, patient usually retains consciousness. On the other side, on the other hand, if your patient's seizure is not confined to any specific side of the cerebral hemisphere and if it has involved both sides of the cerebral hemisphere then it is called generalized seizures. In this type of seizure patient usually loses consciousness. Seizures usually occurs because of the imbalance of the inhibitory and the excitatory processes going on in the brain. Seizure occurs because of the imbalance between the excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmission occurring in the brain. As you can see on the slide, this is normal CNS function. The excitation is carried out by the glutamate and aspartate neurotransmitters, which are excitatory by nature, and inhibitory neurotransmission is carried out by GABA, gamma minor glutaric acid, most abundant inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. So, epilepsy occurs because of too much excitation. That means the glutaminergic neurons are hyperactive or too less inhibition. That means the GABAergic transmission is suppressed. So this slide is showing different types of seizures. So we have the focal partial seizures and we have the primary generalized seizures. Seizure activity starts in one of part of the brain in case of focal partial seizures. And seizure activity involves the whole brain in 
case of primary generalized seizures. The primary generalized seizure is basically further divided into absence seizures, which usually is found in, in children. In this case, patient will be staring and blinking without falling. Myoclonic seizures, whole body of the patient will be jerking. Tonic cloning. First, your patient's body will acquire tone, tone will be increased, and then jerking will start. Tonic only will be stiffed. In that case, your patient's body will be stiff in that case. And atonia is off, is totally a reverse of tonic type of seizures. In this, the patient's body will lose its tone. Your patient will fall down and would hurt it himself or herself. So in this case, we usually prescribe advice patients to wear helmets because they could uh, you know, they might not die from uh, epilepsy in that case, but they might uh, die from the head injuries, concussions or hematomas, uh, head injuries in that case. So then we have the simple uh, seizure, seizure activity while the person is alert. And that involves the jerking of only the one part of the body. Um, Complex type of seizures, seizure activity with change in awareness of surroundings and with secondary generalized. That means seizure activity begins in one area and spreads. In order to get better understanding that how neurons interact with each other, we need to make ourselves clear about the neuron transmission. So when the wave of depolarization arrives at the nerve terminals, what happens is that sodium channels opens and sodium rushes inside the nerve terminals. The high intracellular levels of sodium opens the high voltage gated calcium channels and the calcium rushes inside the cell and fuses with the glutaminergic vesicles. The calcium glutamate vesicle complex moves to the terminal bulb, free junctional membrane and through a process of exocytosis spills all of its contents glutamate neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. The glutamate, which is excitatory neurotransmitter, usually hooks up with its MPA receptors responsible for the influx of sodium ions inside the postjunctional neurons and the NMD receptors and methyl aspartate receptors responsible for the influx of calcium ions inside the postjunction neurons. Now we also have a low voltage gated calcium channels on the post-junction membranes, neurons, and they are also known as the T-type calcium channels, thalamic type calcium channels. Now this is basically a model of excitation. Enhanced uncontrolled activity of glutaminergic neurotransmission causes epilepsy. But this usually is controlled by the in inhibitory impact of the GABAergic neurotransmission, which is going on side by side with the GABA with the glutaminergic neurotransmission. GABA usually keeps a check on the glutaminergic neurotransmission. GABA neuron obviously will release GABA neurotransmitter in the synaptic left, which will uh, which has a specific receptor. GABA A receptor uh, present on the post junctional membranes responsible for the influx of chloride ion and chloride is, is a negative ion it causes repolarization and tries to relax the excited neuron. After the GABA performs its desired effect it has two fates it is either reuptake by GABA transporter or it could be packaged inside uh, the vesicle again or it could be degraded by an enzyme known as GABA amino transferase. Hence the main goal of anti-epileptic therapy is to enhance the depressed GABA ergic activity or to suppress the excited glutaminergic activity or to modulate the propagation of impulses through voltage-gated ion channels. Anti-epileptic medications are generally classified 
into first generation anti convulsants and second generation anti convulsants. The first generation anti convulsants or anti epileptics were discovered or invented before 1990, and these second generation anti convulsants were invented after 1990, so they are newer ones. Epilepsy is usually controlled but not cured with these medications. First generation anti convulsants include phenytoin, carbamazepine, phenobarbital, valproate or valproic acid, and ethosuximide. Second generation anti convulsants or anti epileptics include lamotrigine, topiramate, gabapentin, tigabine, levetiracetam, oxcarbazepine, and zonosamide. Newer agents differ from older drugs by a relatively lack of drug-drug interactions, meaning they have simple pharmacokinetic profile and improved tolerability. However, they are costly with limited clearing clinical activity. This is a schematic diagram showing mechanisms of different anti-epileptic medications. So as you can see over there, the sodium channels are blocked by various anti-epileptics. Carbazepine, uh, lamotrigine, phenytoin, uh, topramate, valproic acid, zonosamide. On the other hand, this high voltage gated activated calcium channels are in inhibited by lamotrigines and topramate. On the other hand, accessory subunit, alpha, alpha 2 delta 1 subunit of the high voltage. Uh, activated calcium channels can be uh, blocked by gabapentin and pregabalin whereas the SV2A proteins found in the walls um, of the glutamate containing vesicles can be impaired with the levy teracetam administration and by impairing the synthesis of these proteins SV2A proteins levy teracetam impairs the release synthesis and release of glutamate which is the excited tree uh, neurotransmitter responsible for excitation um, of the cerebral neurons. Calbamate, on the other hand, inhibits the NMDA receptors and methyl D aspartate receptors responsible for the influx of calcium ions. Again, low voltage gated calcium ions can be inhibited by valproic acid, zonosamide, and ethosuximide. Tiger bean. And by a veteran, two important medications, anti-epileptic, newer anti-epileptic medications. Tigabine uh, blocks the, you know, the uptake of um, GABA back into the uh, nerve terminals. So it blocks its transmission, uh, so it blocks its transport, where on the other hand, Vica veteran uh, blocks this enzyme. Um, GABA amino transferase responsible for the degradation of or metabolism of GABA. So that's how it um, enhances the GABA transmission, potentiates GABA transmission. This is the open sodium channel and this is the inactivated sodium channel. So carbamazepine, phenytoin, and topiramate causes these channels to remain inactivated. For a prolonged period. Lamotrigine, valproic acid, and zonosamide can also do it. Benzodiazepines causes increased frequency of the chloride ion channel opening. In contrast, barbiturates causes increased duration of the chloride ion channel opening and ultimately causes hyperpolarization and relaxation of cerebral neurons. You can see over there, calcium influx is going on through high voltage gated calcium channels. This is calcium influx through low voltage gated calcium channels. Ethosuximide and valproic acid both have the capability of blocking these low voltage gated calcium channels. Okay, so now let's summarize the side effects of anti epileptic agents. Keep this thing in mind. That almost all anti-epileptics can cause sedations and dizziness. Now let's talk about the specific side effects of anti-epileptics. 
Carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine can cause hyponatremia, whereas vigabatrin can cause double vision. Lamotrigine and phenytoin can cause blurred vision, whereas phenytoin can also cause gingival hyperplasia and hirsutism. Topiramate and zonosamide, on the other hand, can cause memory impairment. Topiramate can also cause weight loss. Valproic acid can cause weight gain. Gabapentin and pregabalin can cause peripheral edema. Valproic acid can also cause liver toxicity, centrolibular necrosis of liver, remember? If not, stab yourself a little. Falbamate can cause aplastic anemia. So this is basically a treatment of seizures. For tonic-clonic or uh, tonic-clonic seizures, also known as grand mal seizures, drug of choice is valproic acid. Uh, alternate to valproic acid if your patient is in intolerant with valproic acid. You can also offer your patient topiramate or lamotrigine. We have alternates available as well: carbamazepine, phenobarbital, and phenytoin. For partial, simple, or complex seizures, carbamazepine is the best drug. Then you can also use phenytoin and valproic acid, depending on the tolerability and the side effects. Alternates, we have alternates available as well. For absence seizures, also known as pipit mall seizure, drug of choice is basically ethosuximide. Valproic acid, you can employ it for various uh, type of seizures. At, uh, uh, it has the capability of blocking the sodium channels. It has the capability of blocking the uh, the calcium channels, low voltage cation calcium channels. So it has uh, multiple mechanisms of actions. So you can employ it in multiple seizure states. For myoclonic atonic seizures, valproic acid or valproate is the drug of choice. For status epilepticus, the first or the initial best therapy is lorazepam, diazepam. If your patient is unresponsive to therapy with lorazepam, diazepam, switch your patient to phenytoin or phosphenytoin. Even if your patient is unresponsive to phenytoin or phosphenytoin, then switch your patient to, uh, to barbiturates, phenobarbital. Even if your patient is unresponsive uh, with the therapy of phenobarbital, barbiturates, then switch your patient to uh, IV anesthetics, betazolam or propofol. For febrile seizures, diazepam, rectally, or diazepam, IV is usually prescribed. So these are the agents which are safer uh, in pregnancy. You'll see, these are the safe anti-epileptic med medications. Carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, lamotrigine, ethosuximide. You need to give folic acid supplementation, especially the first trimester of pregnancy.